fossil forest, two sides of the issue of the debate. Um, I just found an article a week ago about uh, young earth versus old earth creationism. It was by a scholar, and he said one of the most contentious issues in that debate would be the age of the earth. Fossil forests do have implications. I haven't talked about the age aspects yet, but you can see the implications, especially when we get to Yellowstone and look at it more closely today. To summarize the way I started last week, we've got two books divinely given. God's Spirit has given us two books and infused both books with his truths. We have the book of nature and we have the book of the divine word, the printed word. One comes with pictures and one only with words. The Bible, of course, only has words, no pictures. It's not illustrated. And the challenge is putting the words and the pictures together so they match. And we're all going to put the two together a little differently. Why? Because when we come to the words of Scripture and we try and recreate or create a picture to go with Scripture like the flood account, we're going to have a little different picture in our mind than everyone else. There are no two human beings with identically the same picture because we don't have identically the same picture minds. And so because of that, I give all due respect to those that have a different picture than I have, sometimes quite a different picture. Sometimes it stretches my mind almost into incredulity. Uh, And I have to uh, say, well, that's their privilege. They think these are brothers and sisters in Christ. So we're going to use this for advancing the outline. Like last week we had an outline and here's our outline. First I want to um, be critiqued. And I published two articles, one minor, it's actually not a full article, it's just a letter in the Creation Research Society quarterly. And I've also uh, published in Answers Research Journal And if afterwards you want, I'll have on each side copies of my letter to the editor. So if you have to leave early, you can get that. And so I want to look at the critique that actually was attached to that letter. It came after the letter by a prominent creationist. Secondly, I think the most exciting fossil forest would be Yellowstone, and I see several people here that have actually climbed those slopes and seen the forest, and I've been there too. We're going to look at both sides. Harold Coffin represents the traditional view, and he wrote a book, um, I have it right here, Creation, Accident, or Design. Dr. Geem always likes to display his books like that. <laughs> Uh, 1969, and he had already visited the fossil forest. He didn't have time to do thorough study until the 1970s on the fossil forests. In 1974, Richard Ridland, who was with the geoscience for many years, and then the Department of Biology, um, he... um, he presented the opposing viewpoint that these forests were not caused by the flood, and he marshaled a lot of evidence for that. A spin-off of the fossil forest studies in Yellowstone was a look at what happened when Mount St. Helens erupted and left uh, fossil forests underwater, Spirit Lake. Then a spin-off from that study is another model, log map model, for Florissant, Colorado. It's one of the most beautifully preserved fossil settings in all of North America. Not just trees, but insects and leaves and all kinds of things. 
even I think a reptile or two, a snake or something. Then you have another article that we're going to mention by Michael Ord looking at the high latitude fossil forests in the Arctic and Antarctic. And then we're going to look at another spin-off. Each model generates more thought and creationists are all the time coming with new models. This is the floating forest model. And then more recently, the thing that sparked my interest in fossil forests would be uh, the Glasgow fossil forest in uh, the heart of Glasgow. And Dr. Bowe, you've been there, haven't you? Yes. Anyone else here? I don't think so. We can comment on that as we get into it. And then we have another spin-off is the floating logs model to explain how animals got to all the parts of the world after the flood. And they all jumped on log rafts. Even the Australian animals, they all seemed to jump on the same raft and ended up in Australia. And that's a serious model being proposed. One of the oldest fossil forests is in Joggins, Nova Scotia. Several here have been there, and I've been there too. And then we have lignite fossil forests. We're going to look at that. We're going to look at the post-flood fossil forest model. In other words, we've got to put the fossil forest somewhere in the geological column. And we have only three choices. One is post-flood. The other is pre-flood. And by default, everything else is during the flood. So those are the only three options we have as creationists and believers in a universal flood, which I accept and believe in. And then we'll have conclusions. Here's the same geological chart that I gave last week. And I think we can, yeah. I'm going to step aside here slightly. Here are just a few of the fossil forests. I couldn't get all the fossil forests on the screen. Uh, one that we haven't talked about is at the bottom, Gilboa. Devonian is the record or the geological uh, era where that's supposed to be. The earliest land plants are in Silurian. So not too long after the land plants were being buried, you have the first fossil forest in Gilboa. I have just one slide on that. The one that might interest us the most, I, I got it there, Glasgow fossil forest. Keep in mind this is in carboniferous. Carbon refers to coal. Coal is pure carbon. So that's carboniferous. And then some new fossil forests that you probably never heard of are in the Antarctic, they're usually Permian, that's in the Paleozoic, or they're Triassic, there's some even up higher than that, but the, most of them are Permian and Triassic. So we'll touch on that briefly. The ones I mentioned last week were, the most fascinating ones were at Jungar, China. And I have one more slide to remind you of what we looked at last week in case you weren't here. We put the Yellowstone fossil forest, or scientists put it, including creationists, right at the top of the column. You have what's called Cenozoic rocks. When we use the term Cenozoic, we're using it without any time designation as creationists. So, but it's still, there is a sequence. And at the top, you have two halves of the Cenozoic. You have Paleogene, the, the older half, and then the Neogene, <coughs> newer half, and the Yellowstone fossil forests are in the older, as well as uh, a new site, Florissant, that's, uh, there's very little said about Florissant, um, and there's an article coming out on that. Okay. If some of you want to jump in uh, during the presentation, that's fine. We have two microphones. This is a review of last week. And um, 
This is Jungar. I said it was West China. It's actually Northwest, to be more accurate, up toward uh, Mongolia. And all of these trees are upright. The roots are spreading out. And four of the trees seem to be aligned. And I'm suggesting the alignment of four trees with the same size diameter, almost identically the same size diameter. Those four trees grew there in place. We call it in situ, S-I-T-U. It means they are preserved in the same place they grew, in situ. Now, I'm willing to look at more than one side, and I will in a minute. Um, the hypothesis of how they got lined up, the two main hypotheses would be they uh, took root on a nurse log, like you have in the Pacific Northwest, on a decayed log. That log had to be a tree at least 70 meters long. I didn't mention last week that we do have fossil trees that long. There's one well-documented fossil tree at Petrified Forest National Park, 65 meters in length, and the top is cut off, so we don't know uh, how it may have been up to 100 meters long. So um, the one hypothesis, nurse log, lined them up. The other, and Dr. Ziprick mentioned that. He's not here, I see, so far. But he suggested he's seen trees uh, up here nearby toward Big Bear, and some of them lined up all in a row, and probably it's a fault. You know, break in the crust of the earth, collects the water, and the water provides the nutrients and the moisture for trees to easily take root. So you might call it a nursing fault instead of a nursing log. <laughs> Uh, the third hypothesis is that you have floodwaters coming along and somehow lining them up all in a row, spacing them out nicely. The problem is the direction. This lineup is pretty much northeast, whereas all the prone logs, and there are more prone logs than upright logs at this site, all the prone logs go east and west. And so there's a disjunct between the logs that are floated in. I have no logs are floated in. Big logs, but they're all lying flat. And um, so we're kind of leaning, we are leaning toward perhaps the nursing log hypothesis. So that's a summary of last week. That's about all I'll say on that. So now let's look at the major re uh, critique. It's found in this uh, journal, Creation Research Society Quarterly, which I will cite in a minute. Uh, and the response came from Timothy Clary. Right at the end of, they printed five pages. And I again, if you came in late, I have copies of that uh, particular article I wrote. Clary has uh, maybe a couple paragraphs uh, critiquing it. He's with ICR, Institute of Creation Research. And he says, no, it cannot be flood deposited because it has thousands of feet of sediments below the fossil forest. And these are extinct trees. And what I was suggesting is maybe the trees grew before the flood, maybe. Uh, the opposite interpretation is that these trees, if it's a natural forest, grew after the flood, and all you have to do is go a few kilometers away and you find in Jurassic rocks dinosaur bones. So if the trees are after the flood, then a few kilometers away in the same formation, you have dinosaurs, which have to be post-flood. And then you go up a little higher in the geological column and you come to Cretaceous, right at the end of the Mesozoic, and there are dinosaur nests right there in that same basin, Jungar Basin, Jungar Basin. 
And so that would be problematic. You'd have to put most of the dinosaur eggs and nests and much of the dinosaur fossil record, you'd have to put it after the flood if this fossil forest grew after the flood. And it's, all the plants are extinct today, but they do have relatives to living plants today. But they're all extinct plants in that forest. And there are a lot of ferns. I didn't refer to another article where it shows a whole bed of various types of ferns that grew probably below these extinct trees. They're conifers, Araucaria, grows in South America naturally. So we have, um, we'd have to put all the flowering plants after the flood if that whole forest is post flood. So that's in the year 2017. You can go to the library and uh, you can get an issue of this. Let's see, I think I wrote it down which issue it is. It's in 2017, the summer issue. And that's, I went there yesterday and the library has copies if you want to read up on other things relative to that. Okay, now a lot of you have come here just to hear what is the verdict on Yellowstone? Where the trees washed in, we call that alochthonous, if you want a fancy term. Or did they grow in place, we call that autochthonous. The word auto it in Greek means self, like automobile. It's a self-sufficient car. It doesn't require an external horse to pull it along. So autochthonous deposits don't require wind, water, tsunamis, whatever, <clears throat> to get them buried. They are buried right where they grow, and they're kind of self-buried is the idea behind that term. Let's go and look at the picture. I could have brought photographs, actual photographs, but I love the illustrations going back all the way to the 1870s. A man named, geologist named Holmes first explored it. And then in the 1930s, um, articles were published, even in Scientific American, and they had a similar diagram. I don't know, maybe this was taken from Scientific American. So, originally they thought they had about 25 levels of trees, and then Richard Ritland went and counted the levels that he could find. He found 40 in one place. Harold Coffin eventually said there are at least 50 levels, and now the latest creationist literature claims that there are 70 levels. And uh, a lot of upright trees, some of them big. And uh, the standard creationist assessment is by Harold Coffin. And his book was published, this book was published too early to get the full scope. His later editions do uh, cover the creationist response uh, view of the fossil forest. Uh, and I'll read this quote in a minute. I want to point out that the fossil forest ignited a firestorm uh, among Bible-believing creationists, both young earth and old earth creationists. In 1949, there was a meeting of the scientific wing of the Evangelical Society. It was called ASA. And they met, I think, in Pasadena. And one of the presenters had just graduated from Wheaton College earlier and he had gone on for doctoral work from Columbia Uni University in radiocarbon dating. And he was fresh out of school with that. And he presented in 1949 the idea that 
Radiocarbon dates can be trusted. They go back 50,000 years, 40 to 50. And even if we didn't have them, he said the major argument for a much longer time period is from the fossil forests. And uh, many of the trees are a thousand years old. Um, and if you have lots of levels with 500 to a thousand year trees, how many years might you have? I want to ask Brian. He shared with me something about his counting of tree rings, and I think you should be on there. This is Dr. Brian Bull. I don't Oh, it's, it's on. Um, I went to the fossil forests about uh, the, um, the time you're speaking of. Uh, it was... Um, one of the early geoscience tours, yeah. and the the forests themselves at the time could be reached only by wading through a Lamar the Lamar River at the base, and it was raining that day. It was not one of the most pleasant geology excursions I've been on, but there were two of us. Um, I was working on the fossil forest, trying to determine if we could how many. Um, how many tree rings there were mm -hmm. in each of the layers. So what we were looking for was to find the largest tree in each layer, count the tree rings, and add them up. And this was a two-man job. Um, I was assisting Neil Wilson, who was along on the trip, and I think he was keeping record and I was counting, or maybe it was the other way around. But we came back at the end of the day soaking wet, cold, um, freezing, covered with mud, but we had located what we thought and agreed upon were about 20,000 uh, tree rings adding up the oldest, the biggest tree in each layer. Um, we didn't um, uh, photographically document each of the layers. As I said, we were happy to have survived the day. It was, it was pretty miserable geology field work. And that was just one of the fossil forests. There's at least uh, two or three. This was uh, not in the northwest park, part of the park, but northwest was Specimen River, I think. No, th Specimen. this was in the main part of the park. And, yeah, yeah. Um, it was within the park. I later went uh, with Dr. Ritland to see another fossil forest outside of the park. Yeah, but this, at least three. this was early when the discussions were going on. I'm fascinated by the fact that uh, when you talk about uh, the other evidences, the number of rings isn't mentioned. So I guess that that's disappeared from view, or have people found some other explanation? Uh, the ring issue has not been a major issue for some reason. Uh, creationist literature does say the latest studies, if you go to all these fossil forests, you have a minimum of 50,000 rings. I, I found that in creationist literature. We could only find 20,000. And you were only at one site. And we were only at one site. And it was dark and cold and we were wet and we gave up maybe too early. <laughs> well, all of you can easily see the magnitude of the problem. If they're all in C2, and that's what I want to deal with in the next six or seven minutes, are they in C2. So you have to have criterion. Oh, pass the mic down. Uh, I want to just say that you have to have criterion. We're going to look at one criterion. I, I was just trying to imagine how you count 20,000 rings. Do you, do you just, um, like, take a section and count them and then then add those sections up to get up to 20,000? Is that basically what you do? You're talking about one level, and you, what Dr. Bull said, you count the rings on the largest tree. The, layer, the layers are quite evident. Um, they are. And they're horizontal. And so what you do is you walk as far as you can along the horizontal layer looking for the biggest tree you can spot. It's not highly scientific. You look for the biggest tree, you count it, and then you go up another level and look for the, for the horizontal change and, and the, the roots of the trees identify a level for you, meaning that the roots of the trees all show up 
And many of the trees in the levels are cut off at approximately the same height, typically three or four feet. So you find the biggest tree you can, you count it, you write it down, and then you scramble up the, the side until you are clearly in a, in a different level. Is it highly scientific? No. Um, but that's how, you get, that's how we got the 20,000. So this is at face value, and we're going to look at both sides now. Here's through the eyes of Harold Coffin, very devout, dedicated scientist, very capable. One criterion for saying that these were washed in is what he called abrupt root terminations. If the trees were washed out of a growing forest and transplanted to their present location, some of the roots, especially the large roots, would be broken. I call it truncated. Now, I'm building a house. I'll be leaving this area. I'll be in Michigan. And I've been out there on the side supervising the excavation. Whenever a tree is uprooted by a bulldozer or a backhoe, all of the smaller roots get snapped off. And it's usually the roots are snapped off to within a meter, not more than two meters of the trunk. And so that's a way to tell if the tree has been uprooted catastrophically by maybe a tsunami or even uh, a fire flow, hot ash, um, that would be a good way to tell that they have been washed in if they're abruptly truncated. Notice at the bottom of this slide that Harold Coffin in this article in Spectrum says he knows of seven examples of sharply truncated roots. And I agree with him. These have been uprooted and transported. No problem. No problem. Another evidence, lack of normal soils, soils in a normal forest. That we'll discuss a bit further in a minute. Another evidence, the flora is way too diverse for a normal forest. You have plants. A few of them have representatives in the subtropics. You have temperate plants. You have uh, northern high altitude, not polar, but uh, uh, alpine plants. And you can have them all mixed together. The pollen represents plants from many different altitudes. So the plant picture is a mixed bag. Another evidence, the smaller upright trees sometimes jut through to the next layer above, and the next layer above has a real uh, large tree growing there. And so, um, theoretically, the small tree should have been totally decayed, rotted away during the time the large tree was growing. And that makes sense. So all of this, he adds up, plus uh, tree rings. You're, you rightly re observe I haven't been making a big deal of tree rings. It's, it's, it's a mixed bag. For example, can you take tree ring patterns from one level to the next to the next and line them up? If you could line up all the rings from all levels, then you have just one forest being uprooted and uh, pro providing trees for all the levels. You don't have that. Mike Arkt, who is uh, lectured from this uh, position a few years ago, he said that we can overlap maybe up to four layers, four levels, with matching tree rings. Um, that could be debated, but uh, um, I think Harold Coffin makes a good point. Generally, when you try and match tree rings, they don't match even across one level. He's tried. I, I, Dr. Bull, I don't think you tried. Because that, that's extremely time consuming. You need half a summer. Yeah, you're just glad to come down in one piece. <laughs> okay, now Richard Ridland actually was the one that launched the shot heard around the Adventist world. 
he published five years before uh, the Spectrum article that I just summarized by uh, Harold Coffin. They were both in Spectrum magazine. If you want to look it up, go to the Andrews website and then look up the uh, periodical index, SDA periodical index. And I mentioned it here, the index right up there. Um, go there, it's online, and put in the name of the last name of the author. You don't need the title of the article. And uh, you'll find everything by Richard Ridland and everything by Harold Coffin available online now. The main evidence, according to Ritland, is this. Associated with many of these forests are remains of ancient soils with well-preserved leaves, needles, twigs, and occasional cones. And even roots and rootlets proceeding down through the uh, volcanic type of sediments. They're sedimentary rocks. They're not igneous. They're not the hot lava didn't come down, but you had volcanic eruptions and you had a lot of not lava flows, you had mud flows with debris from the volcanoes. So that's his main evidence. Other evidence um, could go either way. You have trees twelve feet in diameter and over twenty feet tall. Well, we're going to see Spirit Lake has trees over 20 feet tall uh, standing upright. So that is not a convincing evidence. Roots spreading out from the base of a tree. Well, they go out a little ways, but I haven't seen any pictures yet of roots going out as far as the fossil forest in Jungar, China, which go out on all the trees. They go out at least one and a half to two meters or even up to twelve and a half meters, that one long root. We don't find that in Yellowstone. Um, this, this is valid to a point. Trees are spaced out as in modern forests. An impressive feature, so you know this is one of his lead arguments. An impressive feature of the Yellowstone forest, by contrast, is the apparently natural distribution or spacing of the petrified stumps, such as one observes between living trees. Now, that's, that's a true statement. They're, they're not in log jams. They're not in heaps and piles. They're spaced out. But how do we know they're like uh, natural forests? Yeah, let's hear from Dr. Roth. just wanted to add to this... Uh if there are trees floating, as uh, Harold Coffin's model proposes, they're going to be far apart from each other because the top of the tree will keep them apart. Ah, okay. Good point. And let's consider that in just uh, about two or three minutes when we look at Spirit Lake. So that would explain the spacing. Huh, I didn't read that in his uh, Spectrum article, but I think over the years that's what he's developed. So here's a problem. Remember I said a lot of us can re, re, reproduce a, um, a scientific setting in two dimensions. We're map readers. We can see two dimensions. It's harder to have a third dimension uh, add not only width and length, but add height. The fossil forests have very little to show for the three dimensions other than what's sticking out of the face of the cliff. Um, we're not allowed to excavate in. We don't know how the forests are spaced inside the cliff. Now, I'm using that as my critique of uh, what the claim is that Everything is spaced like a modern forest. We don't have as much information. All we have is a transit, longitudinal transit, and we can see spacing there. Did you want to comment, Dr. Bolt? The um, What you say is perfectly correct, but you can, in fact, get um, a little bit of uh, um, what you would get if you excavated the cliff, because the cliff face, we could scramble up it, and you can go around it, and so you can actually see um, 
uh, transects. You can't excavate, but you can walk around, say, a, a part of the cliff that sticks out. So in that way, you can see at right angles oh. what's going on. And most of us yeah. sort of picture this as a straight up and down. No, it's face. not just straight. It's not. It uh, has little valleys and erosion yeah. going. And as you walk around, you can you can follow. Yeah. But that's not nearly as, as much as we'd like to see, obviously. What, what we really need to do is have a 3D reconstruction of what we can see, and I haven't seen that yet. This is in contrast to what I presented last week. We have a lot of three-dimensional forests where they're spread out um, with height of trees and width of forest. Many of the... And you'll have to maybe look at the... Uh, this will be online, so you can look at it online and see what we were talking about last week. So that's my one critique. The information is only partial on both sides of the debate. And so what I have to do on my scientific side, my non-theological side, is say there's more work to be done. And we have neglected the subject ever since around the 1980s. It just came, came to a halt. No more uh, publications on that. Okay, we're going to march on quickly. I intended by pre-planning to spend a lot of time just on Yellowstone because some of you have been there. Some of you have read all the articles you can get on Yellowstone. Now we come to Spirit Lake, Mount St. Helens. And again, many of you have been there. I've been there. I've hiked up to the top of Mount St. Helens post-eruption. It's a rigorous hike. It's all loose uh, fragments of volcanic material. And for every two steps you climb up, you slide back one step till finally you get to the rim and you look down and you look at Spirit Lake there's the eruption. I think that's before the top of the mountain was lowered by more than 1,500 feet. Here's Spirit Lake post-eruption. I don't have a date on this, but I, the picture comes from Harold Coffin, and I think it's within months. Some of us actually flew over this uh, a couple years after the eruption during a Briscoe meeting. And I, I think you were there, Dr. Roth. Yeah, that was exciting. Just to, they didn't fly us down into the volcanic crater. <laughs> but still, you could see this. I want you to notice something. Um, I sometimes have a problem with that pointer, so I've got my own pointer. See the, uh, the stump? And the roots sticking up maybe a meter in length. And then you scattered throughout this, you have some upright stumps. So you have logs with roots. Um, Dr. Roth mentioned you should have branches that will keep them far apart. At this point, all the branches are gone. They've been shorn off or rotted off. I don't know which. And so this is uh, the way it looked a couple of years after, and now 2006, this is the way it looks. I want you to notice you have logs without the roots. I couldn't find any logs there with roots. So the floating logs left, none of them have roots. Well, what happened to them? The roots can absorb uh, water and become quite heavy, waterlogged. And that sinks the tree down. And as it's sinking, it usually goes root first, not top first. It goes root first. And Harold Coffin uh, did some uh, underwater uh, ex exploring. And he decided that uh, you have a large number of, of uh, stumps that are still upright. You probably could go there today and find upright stumps. This is his first publication three years after the eruption. It's from the prestigious journal Geology. This was a cover article. 
we've had some, uh, at least one publication by Loma Linda faculty on the fossil whales. That was a cover article in geology. It's very hard, very hard to even get published there. We have a few Avenus scholars, geologists that have had letters published there in dialogue. So this was a landmark um, article, very well done. And um, what you see there, this is less than three years. Look at all the upright stumps on that floating log mat, a number of them. And so then when he goes and he starts diving with scuba diving, and finally he uses side scanning sonar to recreate the bottom, he's able to count upright trees, stumps. And this quote from um, the article in Palaios, 1987, that again is a very prestigious paleontological journal. He points out that in less than 1% of the area of the lake, lake bottom, he's found 154 erect stumps. Now that's impressive. And if he extrapolates that to the whole lake bottom, close to 20,000 upright stumps. And uh, they published it past the peer review um, procedure. And I, I think it's, uh, to this day, it's a very worthwhile article to consider. What happens to stumps uprooted in massive eruptions, uh, even with uh, you, catastrophic uh, fire flows, hot air, you know, uh, they're all uprooted melted snow from on top of Mount St. Helens. It all was melted almost instantly and formed huge uh, rivers going down. And so this is the result. Long came uh, Stephen Austin um, even before the eruption. One year before he completed his dissertation at Penn State University when I was in geology training in the mid-1970s at Michigan State, I heard about this guy, Stephen Austin, that was writing with a pseudonym on creation. And so I got his address from, I think, ICR, and I went and visited him at Penn State. And I realized he was doing a dissertation on coal, so I changed my dissertation topic. I was going to do something on coal, and I went to pollen. That's another study in itself. In 1991, Stephen Austin captured all of the research of Harold Coffin and repackaged it, and he applied it to the formation of all the great coal beds of the eastern U.S. He had already suggested a model for coal production in his Penn State dissertation, and his model was the log mat model, or log raft model. And the flood uprooted, he didn't mention flood, of course, he mentioned catastrophism, uh, uprooted millions of trees and redeposited them on the lowlands around the oceans, and that turned to coal. And they approved it. Uh, they approved it. So uh, he presented at GSA, that's Geological Society of America, the lead geology society in America, if not in the whole world. And they approved, through peer review, his presentation, and it's in the abstracts. And then in 2018, he co-authored a paper with Sanders, and he's uh, talking about the floating log mat model which uh, we'll look at in a minute. So what Austin was saying, and other creationists have said, you take Spirit Lake and you look at upright trees and prone logs, transport that concept to the fossil forests of Yellowstone. And of course you have to have lakes there, or one big pond, but you have to have lakes and now we've uh, looked at the possibility that there were four volcanic eruptions forming a pretty big circle around where the fossil forests were. 
and that could have been a lake deposit. And then the trees could have sunk down through that lake to the bottom, some of them sinking upright. But you have to have volcanic flow, mud flow after mud flow after mud flow to form what is now said to be 70 levels inside the park and outside the park. Clyde Webster from our own geoscience here in Loma Linda has verified the idea that there were four sources for volcanism. Not too far apart, but you're talking about dozens of miles, if not further. And so that's how the floating lake model has evolved a bit. You have to have some local lakes, perhaps, rather than a universal flood, um, you know, washing in forest after forest after forest. That's my interpretation now. That's my interpretation. The log Mac model was expanded to Florissant, Colorado. There's a paper in process I, on the peer review. I reviewed it a little over three weeks ago for the Journal of Creation. And this is one of the diagrams, thanks to Michael Ord and his staff. And he, he envisions that this represents flood deposits, uprooted trees, many of them upright. So he gets this from Spirit Lake, by the way. Many of them upright. And with time, they're falling down and they're forming these upright trees. So with time, you know, Mount St. Helens, 25 years later, you still have a log mat there. And there are probably still trees falling down. So um, you've got to allow some time after the end of the flood. And fluorescent, according to many models, would be right at the end of the flood or even right after the flood, a few years after. Fluorescent is in Colorado. We talked about it last week. And that's uh, Michael Ord's model is at Florissant. We talked about this. This is Florissant, the only triple stump arrangement in the whole geological record that we know about. These are petrified logs. They look uh, almost modern. The bark has been removed, showing catastrophic deposition. Uh, the three trees never broke apart. Um, what Michael Ord has to prove in his paper is that a, a catastrophe would not break them apart because you have triple trees growing in the redwood forest today, western U.S. And he has a picture of one that he found. Uh, three large trees. They're not sprouts off of a main trunk of redwood, but it looks like they've grown separately. And I... I tend to uh, buy um, Ord's idea of that. I know we talked about that last week. Could they have sprouted off a main trunk? I don't, oh, sorry. I don't see a whole lot of room between the trees for a large rotted stump there. And uh, it looks like these are three seedlings that grew up. Who knows? I may be wrong on that. So Michael Ord then went to uh, the Arctic regions. Here's uh, some, looks like a fossil tree. I showed this last week. Here's one I didn't show. Darkwood, it's kind of turning into charcoal, but it's not coal. It's not petrified. It's uh, mummified, that's what they call it. And there are whole forests on two islands in um, northern Canada, the Arctic region. The wood can be cut with a chainsaw. It's so fresh looking. Ord uses this as the major argument that this would not be millions of years old, like they would say. They, they date it, I don't know, 30 to 50 million years ago. He uses an argument for a young earth. 
And here's Ellesmere. So the other one was uh, Axel Heiberg. Here's Ellem Ellesmere in Canada. Two large islands. And you have levels like Yellowstone of fossil forests. Not as many. Maybe three or four or five levels, but not as many. Then Michael Orr jumps all the way to Antarctica to show that there are fossil forests there with upright stumps. This is just one example. So that was Michael Ord. And he's been the most prolific publisher and he's going to publish on Florissant. I think the article will get published and I'll tell you about it when it comes out. Uh, someone else that came up with a similar model to floating log mats is uh, Joachim, Joachim Shevin, German paleontologist, creationist. And he came up with the idea of floating forests before the flood. The Andaluvian oceans covered at least three-fourths of the Earth's surface, if not 80 to 90 percent. They, creationists think there was more ocean before the flood than after, which, who knows? No way of measuring it. A lot of the land fossil deposits are marine, like Cretaceous. So it shows the oceans were more widespread at some time in the past. So that's how they come up with 80 to 90 percent. And you can picture floating forests, bouncing on waves, covering hundreds of square miles before the flood. Now this is an image in someone's mind, Shevin. And at the time of the flood, you had tsunamis, and one tsunami after another would wash the forests onto the lowlands, and that's where they became trapped and since have become coal. So this is a variation of Steve Austin's model, which says the forests are like Mount St. Helens. The trees are uprooted, and they form log mats, and then the mats are washed into the shore. Now you have whole forests intact washing to the shore with upright stumps. As Steve Austin knows and some of the other creationists know that most coal beds have upright stumps and it's usually at the top of the coal bed. So you put the floating stumps on top of the floating forests and you can wash them in. The problem, oceans are salt water. And most creationists say that oceans before the flood were salty, but not as salty as today, but still salty. And so how can you collect fresh water to keep the forests alive because salt water will kill the forests? And so this forest model is severely criticized. If you want the to look up on Shevin's model. It's been out for, what, 23 years in Journal of Creation. A lot of the debate is in Journal of Creation. If you want to go there, just go www.creation.com. So it's Timothy Clary that came along and he shot down the model. And uh, people are backing away slowly. They're backing away from it. And uh, although um, Kurt Weiss still advocates floating forests, he's about the only one left. And he was the creationist with the top PhD among creationists, Harvard University pre PhD in paleobiology. So in 2018, Kurt Weiss still came out with his forest, floating forest model reason I haven't put that on the screen, I think that model is dead in the water, so why spend much more time with it? <laughs> okay, we're wrapping up now. Um, Stephen Austin saw a little bit of light in the fl floating forest, and so he said, from before the flood, you had floating forests, and at the time of the flood, it dumped a lot of logs on top of the floors floating forests and you got them all mixed together and 
that form the coal. Well, that's a little confusing. Now we want to end. I won't cover all of the points. I want to end with Glasgow, Scotland. And this is one of the oldest fossil forests. These are extinct trees, Lepidodendron. I brought a sample uh, to show you from last week. That's a Lepidodendron tree. And I used it for a doorstop so you could get in the front door. <laughs> As you're going out the front door, look at that beautiful um, bark. It's called a scale tree because the bark looks scaly. There's one other type, Sigillaria. Most of these are Sigillaria, as I look at the picture closely. So they're a little different than the ones I talked about last week in southern Indiana. So the park was established in 1889. This picture probably is dating from right after then, early 1890s. You can go there to get today and you have a, a canopy a pavilion built over it to protect it from the elements. Did it have the pavilion when you were there, Dr. Bull? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Were these washed in or that is allochthonous or they did they grow in place? Autochthonous. The big debate. When you look at it, it looks like it's growing naturally. It's not tilted over. You don't find any of these stumps on their side. Yes, it's truncated at the top, broken off, but the roots seem to be firmly rooted. They're not broken off. If the tree is broken off and transported for any distance, even a few meters, you wouldn't have the roots going out to almost Right here, they go out <clears throat> almost to the end. I'm sorry, the <clears throat> clarity is not as good. I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know what's happened. But the roots are dichotomous. They branch into two parts. So you have different roots branching out into smaller and smaller roots. Timothy Clary came along and wrote an article in Creation Research Society Quarterly, and it's featured on the cover, 19, I mean 2016. You can look at it afterwards. And he said he had seven evidences that these were in situ autochthonous. One of them was many of the stumps seem to be on a little rise. And if you look closely here, there's uh, sediment underneath here, under, under. And so the stump is up on a rise. Now if you are washed in, you should have the roots flattened out because they're much thinner than the stump and they wouldn't be as strong. You should have it just flat right on the bedding plane. I found the same uh, to be true in the fossil forest, petrified uh, national, for national park in northeast Arizona. Last week I had a picture of a fossil forest of upright trees, and most of them are up on a little rise. I call them on spider legs, and uh, if they were washed in, the roots would be flattened out, and the tree would be like that. So Clary uses this as one evidence. The main evidence he uses as a creationist is we have no time problem. Because he looked at the geology around, and this is in a, um, an area where there's practically no geology directly below the fossil forest. And then pretty soon you go to Precambrian and no fossils. And he s said this could be an antediluvian forest because there are virtually no fossils below it. And that's where the big debate came in. And Kurt Wise wrote a big article trying to counteract that, saying, wait a minute, there is geology below. That has a ramification with what I'm pointing out at Jungar 
China because there are more than 5,000 meters of fossil-bearing sediment. We don't know exactly how many, but more than 5,000 below that fossil forest. And so Clary wrote a response saying that cannot be a true fossil forest. It had to have been washed in by the flood because everything else below it was washed in by the flood. And the dinosaur fossils above it are washed in by the flood. So everything in China had to have been washed in. That's Timothy Clary's point. Well, that's where the uh, discussion has been brought up to date. And that's why I say there are two sides. Um, the point of my research on this, published in Answers Research Journal, more than 50 typewritten pages I submitted, and it was all published. The point of that was that creationists have neglected fossil forests largely for over 20 years. The last major studies were done in 1997. Harold Coffin was very active in the live then in 1997. He published in the journal Origins. And there's about a 20-year hiatus. And just in the last four years or so, there's renewed interest in fossil forests, starting with this article in Creation Research Society Quarterly. Timothy Clary really ignited interest in that. And so I've written a response saying, let's not rest on our laurels. Um, Yellowstone is not a done deal. There's some evidence on both sides of the issue. So I don't take a position, you know, was it all washed in or did it all grow in C2? I don't think it all grew in C2. I don't think so. That's personal opinion. And Dr. Geem always ends by giving his take, and so that's my take. Thank you very much. Uh, you can stay as long as you want, because we have two microphones, and I know Dr. Jack Stout wants to make comments, and there are others that will want to make comments. <coughs> Personally, I can't imagine a scenario that extends beyond an area where you have layers of trees in layers that doesn't have, let me rephrase it. Okay, I'm listening. If these, if these trees are washed in, they had to come from a source that was growing. That's right, yeah. And if it's over time those trees are growing, you still have to grow them somewhere with time, right? And with time, they're going to be at different levels. Yeah, that's right. So it seems like logically you have to expect that you're going to find both. Good. If you find a layered washed in, you have to find the other. Good. Yeah, you have to um, know where the source is, too. And, and it seems if, to be more local than from hundreds of miles uh, away. A minor point. Could you go back to the slide you were just on? Which slide again? The last slide. The last slide, sure. I'll go back. Sorry. Okay. The one with Glasgow 4. There we go. There. There, that's it. Okay. I'm imagining this thing washed in and settled with those length of roots. And it makes sense to me that in the center, if you continue to have erosion, it wouldn't happen there because it's completely covered, where you could erode under the roots. Ah, oh, good explanation. And what you're saying, Jack, is you have maybe a layer that originally went out on both sides. Sure. Yeah. And then subsequent erosion eroded this away and this side away, leaving a remnant of uh, exactly of sediments that is of a different nature than what's below. Now, Timothy Clary's not here. He would argue that the sediments above the level 
the base of the stumps, is entirely different than the sediments on which they're resting. So he's happy to see that sediments below, and you could have sediments before the flood, um, you have a break there, a stratigraphic break, he would say. I guess my comment was that you can look at this either way. Exactly, yeah. But that picture doesn't prove wash-in. No. And I've always said don't base your evidence all on one line of evidence. Otherwise, you'll go wrong. And Yeah. Um, yeah, let's have Dr. Roth, and then we'll have Dr. Askew. I want to uh, agree 100% with your comment that uh, a lot more work needs to be done here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're kind of grasping at a few little examples here and there, you know, and yeah. we have billions of fossils out there. Yeah. Um, few of them are bound to be upright. <laughs> Uh, just by random uh, orientation and uh, uh, the orientation issue is uh, one I could talk about for a long time that uh, uh, really cheap science out there uh, for some of that orientation data but uh, what I want to mention is I was taking a group uh, through the fossil forest once and uh, Right after that, we went to the uh, Hebgen earthquake. Site I remember I was with that group, I believe. In uh, there, I think in 1959, they had a major earthquake that created uh, Hebgen Lake. And uh, you look there at that uh, region right after where, where the dam was formed. Yeah. You look at that region after it, and. Uh, you can see how parts of the hillside is on the south side uh, has slid down uh -huh. and the trees are there and they're upright. That's right. Uh, I'm not advocating uh, always a uh, uh, rafting model. But when I go to Yellowstone and I see those trees and then I see those broomsticks, I don't know if you know what I mean by that. These are little uh, branches, uh, two to three inches in diameter, four or five feet high, upright, mm -hmm. among these great big boulders. Uh, how did they stay upright? if there wasn't some rafting. Uh, another area to study. Good. For every question we answer from a creationist viewpoint, we uncover 10 other questions. I've just quoted Robert Brown, who was a member for years of our class, and he always said that. Go ahead. Mickey. I guess I'm ignorant enough. I'm missing the core of the conflict. So what's the, in, in, in relation to creation um, versus evolution? What, oh, so okay. what's, give me the sound bite of what's the conflict between the in situ and washed in in relation to creation? It, the conflict is in a particular view of creation, which says we have six to 10,000 years according to scripture. And if you follow that very closely, which as a scholar I say we need to follow Scripture closely, then when you have 20 to 50,000 years in the geological record, you've broken the bounds of Scripture. Where do you go from there? And then you have to, then you're totally at the mercy of science wherever it goes, right? And that's the problem is I've, I've tried not to dwell on the actual time issues because how long does it take for a fossil forest to grow anyway, like the one in Jungar, you know? And those trees don't have really good countable tree rings, so it's just anybody's guess. Maybe they grew more rapidly. 
So time is the issue. Yeah. More comments? Way in the back, can you pass the microphone up? We'd love to hear from you. You alluded to this a little a bit in uh, talking about Spirit Lake. Uh, you showed the picture from 2006 where it is uh, still extensively covered with, yeah. with trees. Um, I've had the opportunity to visit Spirit Lake about once a decade ever since the eruption. Really? And to watch the progression of the disappearing forest on the lake as it has gone. I mean, from the very beginning when it was you know, virtually solid, covered with, yeah, with trees, and then you had the pictures showing that. And then at that point, it started to sink and, you know, disappear. And every visit was dr dramatically less trees, but there was always still trees. And we, I was there a year or two ago, and now there's just maybe at most 5 to 10 percent of the lake that still has trees on it. Um, and every wind... Uh, whatever the wind direction, it blows them uh, from one side to the other. Right. So whatever, you know, you're, you're, they're always going to be together in one yeah. part of the lake. And they're not just floating around scattered. They're always pressed up in this solid mat of wood uh, floating on the lake. And so it's really interesting to see how one by one, slowly but surely, each one is eventually sinking and disappearing. And I don't know what the state of the wood is sitting on the lake there. I mean, how petrified is it already, you know, sitting on top of that surface without decaying? Um, but it is interesting that it still is following the coffin model of a slowly, timerly sinking over uh, the 40 years almost that we've had wow. since uh, St. Helens has erupted. And it is matching exactly what he predicted on a bit by bit, fill in the sediment, add a few more trees, fill in the sediment, add a few more trees. And it's not just all in one spot. It's scattered wherever they happen to be floating at the time, sinking down. So it is f a very consistent with Coffin's original predictions way back right. uh, when he first put this together, a very you know insightful thing on his part. And then Steve Austin has added one new twist. And what happens to the bark of the trees? And he says the bark was stripped off almost immediately. And there's supposedly a layer of bark at the bottom. And that can start to coalify right away. That's what Steve Austin has said. But he needs to dive down there and find out. <laughs> Just as a minor point, this is not you know relevant to the conversation, but it is interesting. Um, in the last year, policy changes at Yellowstone National Park have made it so that it is now illegal to go anywhere off trail in the, within the bounds of Yellowstone um, unless it is a regular established trail. And so all backcountry areas are pretty much off limits uh, to any legal activities and explorations. Uh, this was supposedly done for safety issues because people keep falling into hot springs because they're stupid yeah. enough to not know what hot water will do to you. Um, but, uh, you know, it's really frustrating for people who, like myself, have been to Yellowstone my whole life, have pretty much covered every backcountry area, and now it's all of a sudden impossible to go there without yeah. risking a fine and this kind of stuff. So it's, again, the fossil forest is part of the off-trail uh, stuff, which is no longer accessible wow. without special permission. So Dr. Bull and Elder Neil Wilson can no longer just right. go up there and do their thing. <laughs> Any other comments? Uh, you're welcome to come and look at what I have and talk further. Um, yes, thank you for coming.